Thank you for joining us for Three Bees on the Law podcast, hosted by Trisha Barita, Camille Canali, and Susan Dawson. Disclaimer, this podcast is for entertainment and informational purposes only, not meant to provide legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. Also remember, laws change or they differ by jurisdiction. So this is not a substitute for seeking legal counsel in your jurisdiction on the current law applicable to you. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Three Bees on the Law. With finally a new president uh, set to take office on January 20th, we thought it would be interesting to talk about, and actually Susan and I have been talking about on our own, about whether a new president will mean new employment rules, regulations, and laws. And the answer we've come up with is probably, because you know us lawyers, we never want to give a definitive answer. <laughs> it's, um, such a, it's such a lawyer answer. <laughs> probably. Maybe. Uh, it depends. Right. <laughs> and it, it does depend. It, you know, it depends upon a lot of things, um, namely... Um, it can depend upon the makeup of Congress, and I know we're still waiting to see. There are a couple runoff elections uh, still yet to happen that will determine whether we have a Democratic or Republican uh, Congress. And so, you know, the reality is while we can always expect changes with any president, new president in particular, coming in to office, uh, we may see uh, some changes in the short run, as well as long-term policy changes uh, that our new president-elect Biden has said he wants to make. And so, Susan, what do you think is the biggest change that we may see? Wow, the biggest one. Um, I think the push for potentially federally mandated paid sick leave, I think that that is something that you know Biden has talked about, but also with COVID, and our experiences, and we're seeing more and more states talking about this, that that not only would that be a, a big change for businesses, but it's a more likely change than, than some of the other items that he's talked about. Right. And I think one of the biggest uh, things that he's looked at changing is mandating 12 weeks of paid family leave for all employees, regardless of the size of business. And I know right now, federally, there's a lot of um, business size types that can differentiate what who has to provide specific types of leave. Right. I mean, that would be a huge change for so many business owners, even though they've had to deal with that under COVID, not 12 weeks necessarily, but they've had to deal with the paid sick leave concept under COVID. Um, but such a huge change. You know, we're not used to seeing the federal government mandating pay like that, paid leave like that. We're used to seeing them mandating that you provide leave, but not that it be paid. That's usually more of a state or sometimes a local matter. And so, you know, we talked, we've talked about another podcast, how this, the family first coronavirus act was just such a huge shift for so many businesses because suddenly they had to deal with mandated pay for the first time. And how do you deal with that? And how do you pay for it? And what does that look like? But I almost feel like that, the fact that it's already been out there, um, and we're seeing this COVID and we're seeing the pandemic and many people are saying this isn't the last one, that that's almost going to be what lights the fire under this getting this getting some traction. So that's that's why I feel like that would be the biggest the, the more, maybe not maybe the biggest, but the most likely that we'd see. I don't know if we'll see all the way up to 12 weeks, but I would be surprised if we don't see some sort of mandated paid leave. Yeah. And what I think is going to ha also happen is I think minimum federal minimum wage is going to go up. And while I don't think it's going to affect California because our minimum wage is already significantly higher uh, than the federal minimum wage, um, I do expect to see that. Um, increased at some point during this administration. I know uh, Biden talked a lot about that during his campaign and has made pushes uh, for that in the past. Right. Illinois also, uh, just like California, we've got county mandated overtime, overtime, county, county mandated minimum wage. We've got state mandated minimum wage. Uh, a lot of states have been talking about this. I know those aren't the only two. So I agree with you that, that that's going to be another push 
that they're going to make is trying to get the minimum wage up nation nationwide. Right. And I know in California, the minimum wage actually uh, goes up January 1st of 2021 for the mm -hmm. state and a lot of local municipalities. So if you're in California, make sure you check your local, your local, local rules, I call yeah. them to make sure that any workers you have in uh, specific municipalities that have additional higher minimum wages are being properly Yep. paid because you don't want those wage and hour violations in California. Illinois too. <laughs> so a little plug for California there before we. Right. <laughs> before well, we plugging for them. Illinois, I go and check those as well. And I know Camille, you've talked about, and I and I'm putting together kind of a um, California podcast, and I'll do an Illinois podcast on what businesses can expect for 2021 from a statewide basis. But you know, along with the minimum wage comes the uh, salary threshold for the overtime exemption. So any right. businesses that have been in business pre the Trump administration back in the Obama days, if you remember at the very end of the Obama days, there was a uh, regulation change that significantly increased the minimum salary level for overtime exemption. So just to explain for anyone who's listening what that what that is, is when you're deciding whether or not an employee is eligible for overtime, meaning uh, if they work 41 hours, that one hour gets paid at an overtime rate. There's a, a lot of um, factors that go into that determination, but one of them is how much are they paid, right? If they're paid a salary, what is that, that salary? Um, and so in 2016, it was $455 a week, uh, 23,660 a year. I got my cheat sheet. It's the only reason why I know that off the top of my head. I'm not, it's not like I retain that. Uh, but January 1st, it did go up under the Trump administration. It went up to uh, $684 per week. So there was about a $12,000 annual salary increase. But Obama had wanted it to go all the way up to $47,000 a year or $913 a week, which would have been a really extreme change. And lots of businesses were, were preparing for that change. But when Trump won the election, that all stopped. So I'm wondering if we'll see, along with what you're saying, minimum wage increasing, if we'll also see Biden pushing for that salary threshold for the exempt determination to also go up along the lines of what Obama was trying to, to see, which was that that um, the $47,000 a year uh, minimum salary threshold. Yeah, I, I generally, um, while I know businesses struggle to deal with increased minimum wages, you know, it affects uh, the bottom line for many. And so it does require planning. But, you know, the reality is, I think if the minimum wage is increased, you're also likely to see that threshold for exempt employees to increase proportionately um, to whatever that is. I, I think that is the um, unfortunate reality of trying to increase wages across the board is that it's going to result uh, in a lot of businesses being, you know, hurt in the short term, especially if they didn't plan for that. Right. With the adjustment, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, and so I think another thing that's likely um, going to continue to be an issue is immigration. I know that, um, the Trump administration had pulled back on visas and things like that for uh, foreign workers. And I, um, I have to believe just based upon um, past Democratic presidencies that that will likely be relaxed again. Yeah, which will be a big deal here in the Chicagoland area, regardless of your political preference and not trying to make a political statement here. Because I, uh, I know businesses that were huge Trump supporters that were also crying, I can't get any workers now with these immigration rules, right? So not trying to make a political statement, but that could be a benefit, a benefit to employers if that's a little bit relaxed, at least in the Chicagoland area, because we do have a higher um, population of illegal immigrants. Right. Um, and then I also expect diversity and inclusion to continue uh, to be issues and, you know, equal pay, um, discrimination and things like that. 
um, to continue to be pushed and discussed um, with this new administration. I know it was a huge issue, um, you know, this past year, and I expect it to continue irrespective of who holds the office um, for the foreseeable future. Right. Well, there's the uh, was the pay Paycheck Fairness Act that he that Biden has already been said that he's a strong supporter of one of the elements of that law. I believe it's law in California. Correct me if I'm wrong. I know it's it for sure. Obviously, I know it's law in Illinois that you cannot check uh, or, or mandate that an employee uh, or that a, a prior employer, sorry, confirm salary, prior salary. Right. right? And so, as a matter of fact, in California, you can't even ask an interviewee how much they made at their prior job. Right, right. So, that's, and that's uh, the intention behind that is to be able to even out the wage gap, right? Correct. So that's okay, essentially. Right. So that's that's an element of this act that Biden has been a big supporter of. So I'm curious to see if that will we'll see that on a federal level. You know, I mean, it's interesting to see so many federal laws coming from a potentially, you know, from a Democratic standing president, because usually they're, they're more, they're less on federal government control and more on state based. But as a business attorney and employment attorney, one of the great things about the um, Family First Coronavirus Act is that it was across the country, right? And businesses that are in multi-state didn't have to worry about as much. They do now, but in the beginning it was you know, all the same. Now a lot of states have picked up their separate laws, but, but you know, that could be, even though some of these things will be a burden on businesses, it can be beneficial to have them be across the country and not have to deal with this state does it that way and another state does it a different way. Right. I don't see that changing anytime soon for California, at least, because our laws tend to be uh, stricter and more comprehensive than the federal laws. But uh, that being said, I always feel that when there is a federal law, it does provide guidance um, to how some of the California laws should be implemented. Right. Yeah. So um, I think that covers kind of the big um, topics that I had in mind today. Did you have anything else? Susan, you were mentioning something that I wasn't even aware of when we were talking before the recording, Camille, about the uh, the impact on uh, union unionization or the um, the right to congregate. Is that what you said? Well, so um, you know, Biden has uh, stated, and I have to. I apologize. I have to look at the, uh, but he has indicated that he supports the protecting the right to organize act um that and it would significantly change the right and how you unionize and make it easier uh to unionize but it also um, would potentially make it more difficult to classify workers as independent contractors and so i know in california with some exceptions we have done away with independent contractors except for there are certain uh employment groups that are excluded um, from that statute. Uh, but I think that it would impact the rest of the United States even greater if fewer people could be independent contractors. Uh, I know a lot of businesses use independent contractors during really busy times. Like, for example, the holidays, um, they hire independent contractors to help fulfill, you know, their business needs, and then they let them go um, at the end. And, you know, this could potentially put a stop uh, to that. Right, which I think would be a huge impact on many businesses because here in Illinois, there is quite a, uh, a test to you know most companies that I know fail, uh, the 1099 versus W-2, if you're treating people as independent contractors and the state says no, they're employees. But many states don't do not have that. They follow the IRS test, which right. is you know kind of the default test that many people will follow. Um, but to see a federally mandated strict test that is closer to what you see in Illinois and California and other states like that could have a huge impact, especially if you've got now the Department of Labor, the, the Federal Department of Labor investigating and not relying on this just being the state investigating if someone is truly an independent contractor or an employee. So right. that could be a huge yeah. change. In California, in this last election, we had Uber drivers and Lyft drivers right. and Hub 
drivers actually sought an exemption um, from the law that would have required them to become employees and they won um, and they will continue to be exempt. But had they not, you know, Uber and Lyft would have had to take all of these drivers on um, as employees that they previously classified as independent contractors. So it's a huge issue um, and it could affect many different types of businesses that we don't even think about um, until we have to reclassify the employees. Right. Right. So lots to, to follow, lots to look forward to. Well, right. all right. Well, thank you for joining Susan and I today on three B's on the law. We hope you enjoyed our discussion. Thank you for joining us on today's podcast of three B's on the law. Don't forget to like, and subscribe to our podcast. We also welcome any comments. If you'd like to get in touch with us or suggest a future topic, you can email us at 3 T H R E E B S on the law at gmail.com. And because we're lawyers, we need to remind you that this podcast is not meant to provide you with legal advice and does not create an attorney client relationship. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.